Uh, today we'll be talking about retrobulbar hemorrhage. Uh, my name is Dr. Stanley Johncharian from the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. We'll discuss briefly about the etiology, pathophysiology, clinical features, uh, diagnosis, and treatment of uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage. Retrobulbar hemorrhage is a medical emergency uh, at a site threatening, so it should be rapidly managed and recognized and rapidly managed. So uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage is a rare, rapidly progressive uh, site threatening emergency that results in accumulation of blood in the retrobulbar space. The uh, blood accumulation can lead to increased intraoptic pressure. So this, this will in turn lead to uh, stretching of the optic nerve and blockage of ocular perfusion. So this results in uh, Permanent blindness. So, uh, Rowan Williams in 1985 gave this definition. He uh, defined this, uh, it as a space occupying lesion of the orbit leading to forward displacement of the structures as the orbital volume and pressure increases. Neurolog neurological damage is caused by uh, direct compression uh, by bony fragments or indirect uh, compression of the nerves caused by hemorrhage. Coming to the causes of uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage, it can be spontaneous uh, as in uh, orbital vascular abnormalities, coagulopathy, septicemias, and controlled hypertensions, vigorous activities, uh, post traumatic as in, in orbital fractures, default fractures, high level mid fractures, post anesthesia in uh, periorbital injections, uh, retrobulbar injections, etc. Uh, post-operative after a blepharoplasty, endoscopic sinus surgeries, uh, or other surgeries like strabismus surgery, glaucoma valve implant, or uh, lacrimal duct uh, surgeries. Spontaneously, it can be uh, due to uh, a lymphangioma, AB malformations, or uh, it can also be due to coagulopathies, septicemia, as already mentioned. Post anesthetic uh, injections, uh, retrobulbar injection or uh, injection into the uh, periorbital injections and injections into the peribulbar region, all these anesthesias can lead to bleeding and uh, and retrobulbar hemorrhage. So, uh, subtenance injection, all of these can lead to uh, blood accumulation in this uh, retrobulbar space. So the space is very uh, minimal and very confined because of all uh, all the four sides have uh, all the three sides have bony covering. So there is not much of space to for the uh, eyeball to expand, and uh, anteriorly it is limited by uh, the tendons. So uh, post traumatic uh, it can be uh, associated with orbital fractures. Uh, in two large retrospective studies that was conducted, it was seen that a 0.45 to 0.6 percent chance was there for a retrobulbar hemorrhage. So these should be identified immediately. Uh, clinically, when you see, there will be a tense eyelid that uh, need incision and, uh, and cantholysis. That is a treatment for it uh, that requires cantholysis. So as I already mentioned, uh, due to retrobulbar space being surrounded by bone medially, laterally, and posteriorly, increase in pressure in the space will result in a forward shift. But uh, since the tendons are present, uh, the uh, superior and, uh, and inferior uh, uh, tendons are present, uh, the, there won't be any space for this to expand. So clinical uh, features uh, is a livid cyanotic swelling, uh, narrow spontaneous palpable lid. Uh, there'll be a narrow opening. Uh, patient won't be able to open his eyelids. Uh, it'll be swollen. Uh, there'll be protrusion of the globe. You can see in the CT image, uh, it is uh, one is a little protruded than the other. So up to 10 millimeters as diagnostic of retrobulbar hemorrhage. Increased ocular, intraocular pressure of more than 80 mmHg. Then uh, ischemia of the optic disc and retina can with clearly reduced vision. All of these can be seen. Most common symptoms include pain. Pain is of lancinating quality. It is very severe. There will be pressure 
loss of vision, diplopia, nausea, and vomiting, visual flashes, amaurosis fibers, that is because of uh, the compression of optic nerve due to this hemorrhage, uh, due to the pressure from this hemorrhage, there will be uh, a short period, there will be a loss of vision. It's called amaurosis fibers. So the diagnosis of uh, retrovertebral hemorrhage is clinical and depends on the history of the patient. Diagnostic clues for uh, retrovertebral hemorrhage include severe pain, proptosis, loss of vision, and subconjunctival hemorrhage. So if the patient is a victim of trauma, periorbital ecchymosis and eyelid hematoma may be seen. So uh, you shouldn't wait for uh, uh, imaging modality uh, because it is an emergency and you need to, it is just a clinical diagnosis. So if the cause of the hemorrhage is not found, you can uh, go in and take a CT. Otherwise, it is purely a clinical diagnosis and uh, you need to uh, open it up as soon as possible in the in your OP itself or in your casualty setup. Uh, so that is, uh, however, if the origin of uh, retrovertebral hemorrhage is known, so you need to take a CT. You can also uh, test for his hemoglobin platelets, see if he is taking any anticoagulation medication. If so, then uh, his bleeding can be increased. Coming to the treatment, medical management includes uh, basically drugs that are directed towards reducing the intraoptic pressure. So oxygen therapy with 95% oxygen and 5% carbon dioxide uh, can decrease the ischemic insult by dilating the intraocular vessels. Manitol 20% IV uh, of uh, IV infusion 1.5 to 2 gram per kg over 30 minutes. This also reduces the intraoptic pressure. Acetazolamide, uh, 500 mg IV also lowers the intraocular pressure. Steroids can be given. Steroids of uh, methylprednisone 100 mg decreases the inflammation and edema. Topical beta blockers also decreases intraocular pressure. These therapies are, uh, as I said, uh, aimed at reducing the intraocular pressure. And these are not. These are uh, uh, used along with the surgical treatment. Not uh, you can use it alone. So. Coming to the surgical management, so if it is immediate post-operative period, you can take him back to the OT and uh, perform exploration, see if any blood vessel is uh, bleeding, if there's any bleeding, you can cauterize it. Even if it is a late post-operative period, you can, uh, late post-operative period, you can uh, remove the dressing, remove the suture and uh, locate any bleeder and cauterize it. So if it is uh, if it is post trauma, you need to perform a canthotomy and inferior cantholysis. So lateral canthotomy is the emergency treatment for orbital compartment syndrome that is uh, blood collecting in the retrovertebral space, uh, space and uh, causing uh, compression on the uh, optic nerves. So um, you need to position the patient in a supine position and uh, you need to stretch. If you stretch your eyelid, you can you can feel your medial canthus, and uh, the same way on your opposite side towards your uh, lateral side of your eyelid, on the inner part, you have your lateral canthal tendon. So it has two uh, branches: a superior branch and an inferior branch. So you need to prepare the skin with uh, uh, betadine solution. You can drape the area and then inject a local anesthetic with uh, adrenaline. Probably one is two, uh, two lakh will be good enough. Then uh, you need to take a hemostat and pass it between your uh, uh, eyelids and uh, compress the area for 20 seconds, uh, 20 seconds to two minutes. So that uh, when you're cutting it, there won't be much of bleeding. And then you take a iris scissor and then you cut one to two centimeters so this is canthotomy. Then you take, uh, so that is the procedure shown in the big, uh, figure. Then you take the scissor and then you strum it across uh, the ligament. To, you can feel the ligament actually, that is a tactile sensation. And then you strum it and cut those ligament. So initially inferior uh, canthotomy will be good enough. Uh, if still there is, uh, if the eyelids are tense, you can uh, cut the superior tendon as well.
So uh, I have a short video here that shows this technique. In this video, we will discuss how to perform a lateral canthotomy with cantholysis. The equipment we used is lidocaine with epinephrine with corresponding needle and syringe, a 15 blade scalpel, this is optional, a pair of scissors with a fine tip such as Westcott scissors or iris scissors. You can use the small scissors in many disposable suture kits. However, this often does not have a very fine tip, which makes the procedure a little more difficult. And you will also need a pair of small toothed forceps. After cleansing the skin with betadine, we injected the lateral canthal region. We had first injected superficially, then we injected some anesthetic along the upper and lower lid, and then we injected deep all the way to the orbital rim. The type of anesthetic is not important. However, we prefer lidocaine with epinephrine. While you're injecting, take care to avoid the globe. Okay, demonstrating the technique here of uh, some local anesthetic in preparation for a lateral canthotomy with cantholysis. This patient's having an eyelid repair for a ectropion. He's got some chafed skin from the constant tearing, but we're going to go ahead and get him. Uh, okay, here we go, sir. A little poke and a pinch as we come in here. So I'm directing the needle, staying away from the globe, just in the superficial skin here initially. A little burn. Keep breathing, big deep breaths in and out. You're doing great. So I find that one to two cc's is all we're gonna need. And once I've got that in there superficially, I'm gonna take and direct and put some down into the lower lid here. Some into the upper lid as well. Again, I'm staying away from the globe, but getting the canthal angle. Good. And lastly, now I'm going to direct the needle down to the lateral orbital rim. I can feel bone here. I back off a little bit and I'm going to go ahead and get a good dose of anesthetic down in there. This is xylocaine or lidocaine with one to 100,000 epinephrine, 2%. And that should do it there. Okay. Once local anesthesia is obtained, make an incision using the 15 blade scalpel or your pair of scissors. Many sources recommend clamping with hemostats prior to the incision, which may aid in hemostasis. However, this step is not necessary. Once your incision is performed, Use the forceps to grasp the edge of the lower lid and apply anterior traction. This anterior traction allows you to strum the ligament with the scissors, which lets you know where you need to cut. Continue strumming and cutting the fibers of the ligament until you have completely released the inferior canthus. Once it is released, you will notice that you will have complete laxity of the lower lid. Now we're going to perform a lateral canthotomy with cantholysis. First step is to perform about a half inch, one to two centimeter incision here at the lateral canthus. So that's what I'm doing here with the 15 blade. We just kind of open things up right there. Good. That's our access point. The next step we've talked about is to grasp the edge of that lower lid and uh, pull anteriorly, pull away from the eye. And as we do that, you'll see it opens up a little triangle down in there for access. We're going to take some Westcott scissors. And with these scissors, as I insert down into that triangle, I can feel those lateral canthal ligaments down in there. So as I go like this, feeling those ligaments, there's a snap there. I can strum those like a guitar and feel those. We're releasing, we're releasing. I'll do another little additional snip on the, the cond right there. Thank you. So as we come down, so that's pretty much released. I can feel a little bit more right in there. I'm just gonna take, good. So 
So now we can see the difference. This lower lid is, is loose. It's been fully freed from that lateral orbital rim. Uh, if I come off there, you'll see the laxity and looseness. So that's an inferior cantholysis that's been performed after a lateral, lateral canthotomy. So we've just used a little bit of cautery to uh, get a, a little better visualization here, but uh, the canthotomy has been performed with the incision. The cantholysis has been performed. You can see the, the looseness with which we have that lower lid freed. That's what you're looking for. If you're trying to do a canthotomy with cantholysis urgently, you can see the, the freedom of movement of that lower lid. That can be repeated on the upper lid as well if needed uh, to, to get even more freedom. Thank you for watching our video today. Please subscribe. that doesn't uh, reduce the pressure, you can uh, even open up the lateral wall of the uh, eye, or uh, you can even uh, do a terional uh, orbital decompression. You can, as you can see in this picture, you can open a portion of your skull and that is a neurosurgical procedure. So in conclusion, retrovalvular hemorrhage is a medical emergency that needs uh, proper treatment, immediate treatment. Uh, it's a fairly simple procedure uh, that can save a patient's eye and his vision. Uh, Post-operatively, uh, you need not uh, close the wound. You can even close it after a, a week or so, but uh, even if you leave it open, it is fine. It will heal on its own. As it doesn't have much of complication. It heals uh, rather well. So that does it. Thank you.